Maverick News. The world is watching. In a universe full of ideas, we draw lightness from the dark to a place where opposites attract. Right meets left, positive touches negative, sparking an explosion of truth. Because politics makes strange bedfellows. Good evening and welcome to Strange Bedfellows, episode 32. I'm Lori Spencer. Tonight, my usual co-host, Rick Walker, is taking the weekend off for Easter and some family time and some birthday time. And uh, boy, if anyone deserves some time off, we all know it's Rick Walker. He's the hardest working man in show business, so he actually is going to get to take a holiday off. How nice. And it's just me flying this plane tonight, but don't worry. I'm an experienced pilot. I'm not going to hurt you. And I have a, a terrific guest tonight on the show. It is my pleasure once again to welcome back Kennedy assassination historian James Diogenio, uh, who has written numerous books and articles on the JFK and RFK assassinations over the past three decades. His latest book is the JFK assassination chokeholds that prove there was a conspiracy. Jim also wrote the screenplay and the accompanying book for Oliver Stone's epic new documentary series, JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass. He's also the editor-in-chief of Kennedy'sandKing.com, an invaluable resource for information on the murders of President John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, and Dr. Martin Luther King. Tonight, we're going to take a deep dive into the evidence presented at the trial of Sirhan Sirhan, whose trial was underway 55 years ago this month. We'll take a look at the case for the prosecution and for the defense, and we'll talk about some new information that's come forward in the half century since. Jim tonight is going to explain why he believes Sirhan's gun could not have killed Robert F. Kennedy. And he presents a very compelling case for a conspiracy. i tell you what, a fascinating conversation is always guaranteed when Jim DiGenio is here. And ladies and gentlemen, let's bring him back in right now. Jim, good evening. Great to see you again. Good evening, Lori. How are you doing, partner? Doing great, partner. It's great to have yeah. you back. Thank uh, you so much. I think, I think the last time we spoke was... Last November, of course, around the 60th anniversary of the JFK oh, right. case. I think, I think you're correct about that. And yeah. we've had you on the show many, many times to talk about JFK, but we've never actually done a show together about RFK. And I know that you are expert level on that. Well, and, okay, uh, hold, hold it. I, I wouldn't quite say. I'm not in the <laughs> Well, you wrote here. a book about it. <laughs> I, oh, no, actually, what I did there is I edited a book that included the RFK case. Um, yeah, the, assa I, the assassinations, right? What? It was called The Assassinations, right? Right, and that's, yeah. that's the only book I believe out there that's about all four cases, including Malcolm X. Although there's a film out now, I don't know if you're aware of this, by Libby Handros called Four Who Tried. Four Who Tried. Right, and that's, yeah. and if you haven't had her on, you probably should have her on. Okay. I would love to. Yeah, and she, she has actually gone ahead and put a film together about all four assassinations of the 60s. But I think The Assassinations is still the only book about all, all four of them. Yeah, now, I believe that's You mentioned right. the trial of Sirhan and the evidence. Yeah. I think a better subject would be the evidence that was not presented. That was not presented. <laughs> at the trial of Sirhan. Because yes. I'm, I'm pretty sure... Anybody who examines the record of that trial would come to the conclusion that Sirhan really didn't have a defense, okay, and that the prosecution was essentially able to run wild, okay, you know, over uh, the defendant, all right. Um, now, let me, let me explain a little bit about why I believe that is the case. Please. Uh, 
I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Bill Harper. Mm -hmm. You have? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. Bill Harper was a very illustrious criminalist. Okay. Uh, now, let, let me explain. What a criminalist does uh, is that he is supposed to examine the crime scene, examine the evidence at the crime scene, and go ahead and reconstruct what he believes happened based upon that evidence, okay? And Bill Harper was very good at this. I think he was working for the Pasadena Police Department or the DA's office at the time. And he took a very strong interest in what had happened at the Ambassador Hotel the night Bobby Kennedy was killed. And he was allowed to go in and examine the evidence that the LAPD had. All right. And he came to the conclusion that there were two assailants firing that night, okay, at the um, pantry, in the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel. And he even wrote, it, wrote this up. And he went ahead and he called Grant Cooper. Grant Cooper was the lead attorney for. Uh, for Sirhan, and he left a message for him, and he always insisted that Cooper never called him, okay, hmm. you know, which is really, really kind of weird, you know, when, when, when you think about it. We'll get to why I don't think Cooper was interested in this a little bit later. It has to deal with a, a very interesting incident in, involving Johnny Rosselli, all right? Which I'm sure you're aware of. All mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So if you don't have a criminalist uh, to argue the evidence uh, in this Robert Kennedy case, then the prosecution, their case looks pretty strong. Okay. For the obvious reasons that there were all these witnesses there and they saw Sirhan jump out. Uh, I think he uttered an expletive against Bobby Kennedy. He said, he uh, Kennedy, you son of a bitch. Something like that. Right. <clears throat> so, right. And, he, and he starts shooting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So obviously everybody's attention is going to be drawn to the front of Bobby Kennedy where Sirhan Sirhan is, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody's going to be looking there. Okay, very, 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 very few people are going to be looking in the other, on the other end. Okay, all right. So, as they say in DA's office, this is an open and shut case. Okay, you know, because you have... All Certainly the looks that way when you've got right. 77 yeah. witnesses. I mean, that's what makes yeah. this case distinct from the MLK and the JFK assassinations. Right. Because we could never, ever, you know, put a witness who could say, I saw Oswald in the window with the gun, or I saw right. well, James Earl Ray with everybody, a gun. You know. <laughs> here, everybody saw the guy with a gun, and he's right. screaming, yeah. and he's firing his pistol, and right. yeah, it seemed like so, a pretty open and shut case. <laughs> now, you know what's really interesting about this, about what you just said? Is that Lisa Pease, who wrote a very good book about this, mm. a lie too big to fail. Lie too big to fail. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She's been a guest on this program several times. She, With you, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. She came yeah. to the conclusion that's why it was designed this way. Okay. Because in this time, unlike with the King case and unlike with the JFK case, now you had the assailant right out in front. So there couldn't be any question, okay, about what... In the, in the eyewitness, you know, part of the case. All right. Well, mm, you unfortunately, would think. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately for the prosecution, well, maybe fortunately, if you look about it in a roundabout way, uh, Thomas Nagu and Thomas Naguchi, who was a coroner in L.A. at that time, he happened to know Cyril Wecht. Okay, and Cyril Weck by this time had developed a reputation as being the only pathologist, forensic pathologist in America, okay, who was critiquing the John F. Kennedy case. All right? That's right. 
Okay, and so, um, and by the way, he came about that in a roundabout kind of a way, which we won't go into right now. It's not like he was working on this as his ambition in life. It was a kind of accident that he that he fell into this. All right, and so uh, Noguchi calls up whacked and he goes they're gonna bring bobby kennedy's body okay to my office and <laughs> and he goes what am i gonna do here and he goes whatever you do get observers okay who will watch over you okay because one of the biggest problems with the jfk assassination is that it was not controlled by the pathologists who were supposed to be controlling it so, it yeah, that one was by, controlled uh, by the Pentagon, it sounded yeah, like. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. It was controlled by, they let all these military guys in, and they obstructed the autopsy. So whatever you do, make sure you get professional guys in there who will be sure that you're able to proceed the way you want to proceed. So Great advice. The, and you know, that was always the argument that Noguchi, the LAPD, the DA's office the attorney general's office in California, they all said from the very beginning that we're going to do the most thorough investigation ever, right? Because we want to be so transparent. We don't want another Dallas. Right. We don't want it said that we didn't cross every T and dot every I. Right. <laughs> and uh, they, you know, and they did at least give the appearance of a public fair trial for Sirhan. It lasted for four months. The trial opened in January of 69 and ended in uh, mid-April. You know what's kind of interesting, just as a side note, Jim, that that trial of Sirhan coincided exactly with the trial in New Orleans of Clay Shaw, oh, of Clay that Shaw Jim trial. Garrison was doing. Right. Yeah. Right. So and one of the people that Noguchi got there that night was Pierre Fink, okay, uh, who was one of the three pathologists on the JFK case. So this is really good protection, okay, for what he was doing. And so when Wecht, when Wecht read the autopsy, now, let me give you one point of comparison. The autopsy report on the JFK case is seven pages long, hmm. all right? Noguchi's autopsy is 60 pages long. Mm-hmm. Okay, and when Wecht read it, he said words of the effect that it was the finest medical legal report on an autopsy that he'd ever seen. Okay, it, it, it was that thorough. All right, that's high praise coming from Dr. Yes. Wecht, right? You know, right, and it, it, photographs on top of all those pages. There right. were many, many photographs that, of course, have never been seen by the public because uh, everyone, even the conspiracy researchers, seem to agree that we don't really want to see them and we don't want them out in the public like the jfk autopsy photographs that are just so ghoulish and horrible um it seems like because Nagushi's written report is so thorough everyone i think seems to agree that the photographs wouldn't add anything because the the written report tells you all that you need to know correct right it, well, yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. Over 60 pages, I think you can say a lot. That should cover yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, one of the things that Noguchi was really puzzled by was the fact that in the fatal wound to Kennedy's head, it came in from behind, okay? But mm -hmm. what, pu what puzzled them even more was it was tattooed, mm -hmm. okay? What, what that means is that when you, when you uh, fire a weapon, whether it be a rifle or a handgun, okay, there is inevitably particles that come out of the barrel of the gun. And if the target is like 50 feet away, the particles will dissipate into the air. But if the target is very close to the barrel of the gun, the particles have nowhere to go. And so they implant themselves on the body of the victim. And that is what happened in the JFK, in the, excuse me, the RFK case. 
So Noguchi was very puzzled by this. All right. And so this is what he did. He brought in skins from some uh, pigs or something. Pigs, I think, yeah. Yeah, and he put them Pigs' ears. Against, right. Mm -hmm. And he put them up against the wall. And then he lined himself up in the back of the room and started firing a very similar weapon at the target. And he, after getting closer and closer and closer... He said the only way he could get that tattooing effect is when the gun was like three inches or four inches away from Bobby Kennedy's head. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the only way he could get that tattooing effect because the tattooing effect was very pronounced. It was yeah. like a black rim. Black. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. All right. Now, why is this so important? Well, it's very, very important. Okay, because A... Nobody saw Sirhan anywhere except from the front of Kennedy. Okay. Correct. And B, no one ever said that he was that close to Bobby Kennedy. Okay. No one. No one ever said Witness that. reports vary, but it seems like they, they put Sirhan at a distance between two and four feet in front right. of Kennedy. In, in, in right? front of Kennedy. Yeah. Okay. All right. And and but the point is nobody ever put him behind Bobby Kennedy. That's right. Okay. So And later we'll talk about who was standing behind Bobby yeah, Kennedy, well, but we'll, we'll, we'll save we, that we, part for later. Yeah, we have to build a suspense here. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's killing me. <laughs> All right. And so so this this report and by the way, he came to the conclusion that all of the bullets that hit Bobby came from behind at upward angles. Okay. All right. And so this report and him as a witness was very powerful evidence that Sirhan was not the gunman who actually killed Kennedy. I mean, Sirhan might have fired some of the bullets that hit other people. Okay. Because I think there was something like five or six. Am I right about that? Because I haven't studied this. There case. were five other victims that yeah, night, right. yeah, okay. Okay. including our friend Paul Schrade, our, our uh, late, who was our shot in the friend. head, and there was an right. ABC cameraman and uh, a lady and yeah. uh, Einstein. Yeah, okay, there was uh, right, and so and all of the rest of the victims made a full survived. recovery. Yeah, they survived. Right, thankfully. All right. So anyway, what 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 happened now? is that A, when Noguchi took the stand, the prosecutors danced around his autopsy report, okay? They never asked him these very potent questions, okay? And B, Grant Cooper did not get the autopsy report until just a couple of days before Noguchi was going to take the stand. And Grant Cooper, if you can believe it, simply asked one of the questions he asked Noguchi, uh, would it matter where this gun was in the killing of Robert Kennedy? Couldn't have killed him from a foot away. Can you imagine ans asking that question three feet away? From so Noguchi had to say, yes, yeah, could have. Okay, so he never mm -hmm. asked him any of the pertinent questions. Okay, that, that would have posed a very serious problem for the prosecution. All right. Okay. Now, now, if you can believe it, the other serious problem with this case is something that really didn't get into the press until after the trial was over. And this was the fact that there were too many bullets expelled, mm. even if Sirhan could have gotten off everything in the chamber. Okay. Because if you count all the bullets, and this includes the holes in the ceiling, the holes in the wall, the holes in the pantry swinging door, okay, the holes in the other victims, okay, you know, you get something like 13, 13 holes in the pantry that night. And even if his chamber was full, there were only eight bullets in the chamber. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, but on top of that, I'm sure you know who Carl Euchre was, right? Oh, sure. He okay. was the uh, assistant Mater D, right? At the right. ambassador. He was a big guy. guy. And he was right. like the first guy to jump on Sarhan and was closest to if him ever, at the if time. If you've ever seen pictures of Carl Euchre, yeah. he's built like an offensive lineman in football. Yeah. Okay. He is. He's like a Huge. fire hydrant. Okay. Yep. You know, and Sirhan is a little scrawny guy. He's like five, four and a half, yeah. 120 pounds soaking wet. Okay. All right. And so Euchre always insisted, always, that I grab Sirhan's gun hand. The most bullets he could have expelled with any accuracy was two. You know, he thought it was only one. Okay. But the most he could have expelled was only two. All right. All right. So how on earth did those 13 bullet holes get into the pantry? Okay. And so a few years ago, there is an acoustics technician, Von Prague, Philip Von Prague, mm -hmm. okay, who got a hold of what's called the Przinsky tape. Okay. Right. What is a Przinsky tape? The Przinsky tape, a guy came down from Canada to do reporting on the Robert Kennedy campaign, okay? Radio um, reporter. Yes. That's yeah. why it was only an audio recording, not uh, film. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was taping what was going on there, you know, in the Ambassador Hotel, and he was following Bobby, okay? All right. And his tape ended up, in the California archives. A copy of the tape ended up in the California archives. Where it sat for like, what, right. 35 years and nobody now, even noticed it or now, analyzed now, it? That, that was going to be my next punchline, which you just <laughs> stole from me. Okay. All right. now, can <laughs> Sorry. You, can you imagine an investigation that would not unearth this tape? Okay. I mean, give me yeah, a It always break. seems strange to me how it only what, popped what up kind around. What investigation would yeah. not, you know search for this tape you know all right and so ah they, but a lot of photographs and films that were in the archives and in right. evidence as yes. you well know were later destroyed and mysteriously they disappeared, disappeared. Yeah. yeah so something like two thousand photographs mm -hmm. right yeah all right so now what happens is finally somebody puts two and two together and says why don't we listen to this tape and send it to an acoustic scientist Okay, and see what he can do. Or sort of like the John Kennedy case, which they finally did in 1978. They acoustically tested a tape. All right. And so the guy goes ahead, Philip von Prague, tests the tape. Okay. And he comes up with probably 13, maybe 14 sounds of bullets. Okay. All right. Coming into the. Now. This is pretty interesting evidence, if you ask me, mm -hmm. okay, because it matches up for, with the physical evidence, the holes, you know, and the victims and the holes in the walls. And so here's another piece of evidence that seems to indicate that there was at least a second gun going off in the... Had to be. In, I mean, the if there were 13 gunshot sounds on right. the tape and it was a reliable analysis of the tape then we could draw no other conclusion. Yeah, that would seem to indicate pretty strong evidence that there was a second gun going off mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in, in the pantry that night. And how on earth Sirhan's lawyers didn't find that tape at the time of his trade is just astonishing, you know? I mean, really. It's like you so, said, they weren't trying very hard for their client, were no, they? No, I, I, I would... They, they were, yeah. as they say, the turn of phrase is less than zealous defense <laughs> exactly. okay, so so this is another serious problem okay first you have the directionality okay then you have the distance and then you have the fact that there seems to be too many bullets going off in the pantry that night all right so these would all be exculpatory pieces of evidence at sir Han's trial well guess what that isn't what happened you didn't mm -hmm. get a Perry Mason kind of defense, you know, exposing the prosecution for the incomplete investigation that they did. And in fact, you didn't get very much of defense at all. 
All right. And in fact, the uh, Sirhan, see, if you take a look at um, that trial, you know, I just did, actually. Oh, okay. um, I was writing, a, I was doing a series on this 55th anniversary, and I hadn't actually gone through the documents. I, I reviewed them when they first came out in the late 80s. Um, and then I, you know, I didn't look at them again for several years, maybe one or two. But I mean, I did a deep dive, Jim. I went like through all of the trial transcripts and the press clippings and uh, Sirhan's testimony and everything that I could possibly find witnessed testimony. Uh, once again, thanks to the Mary Farrell Foundation for such a great collection, making those documents available online and searchable really made my work easier because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. It's like going through the JFK documents. But uh, anyway, I just, it was fascinating to go back and review it again after all these years. And I honestly found some things in there that made me change my mind. I had been a believer in a second gun conspiracy theory for 25 years. And I've actually changed my mind after a, a review and come to believe that Sirhan was the only one and acted alone. Are you serious? I am. Even after <laughs> what I just said? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, Lori. Well, I guess we should stop the show right now. I no, <laughs> no. I, I want you to present your case for the defense. I didn't mean to cut you uh, off, yeah. and we'll debate the finer points as we go along, but it's I certain. wanted to give you the opening statement, the opening argument. Oh, okay, well, thank you. You're being a lot more fair <laughs> than the judge at the trial. Okay. Ah. <laughs> See, Sir, Sirhan did not want to admit that he had been duped, that he had been mind-controlled, that he was out of control that night. He didn't want That's to admit right. this. Okay. Because in, in his culture... Hmm. it's not good to look crazy. Yeah. You know, he well, didn't yeah. want to look, yeah. it, it's a sign of weakness uh, in Palestinian culture to be crazy. There's a stigma so attached to it. he blurted out on the stand that he had been planning this for 20 years. He did. Meant, he said, quote, I killed Robert Kennedy with 20 years of right. malice aforethought. So in other words, when he was four years old, he was mm -hmm. thinking of killing Robert Kennedy, which is, of course, Ridiculous. And it's a hilarious uh, thing. How the, well, it's not really hilarious, but there was something that struck me as funny about it that day in court when he had this outburst. I mean, he was out of control. The judge was literally threatening to strap him to his chair if he didn't calm down. And he threw himself at the mercy of the court. And, and his lawyers were just standing there dumbfounded that their client is confessing and saying, I don't want a defense. I want to fire my defense team. Mm -hmm. I did it. I'm guilty as hell. I did it because Robert Kennedy supported Israel. You know, fuck that guy. I killed him. I did it. <laughs> Put me away. Send me to the gas chamber. You know, I, he just said, we can do away with this trial right now. And his defense right. lawyers are over there like, Sirhan, shut up. <laughs> We're trying to get you out a way out. They knew they couldn't get him cleared, right? Well, no, were, no, that was hopeless. They were just trying to save him were. from the gas chamber. Yeah, not with know. the kind of defense they were offering, which was next to nothing. Okay. Exactly. You know, yeah. but uh, but but he made these these out. The judge, by the way, refused to accept that confession. He insisted that the trial continue and that Sirhan, if he didn't like his lawyers, well, get some new lawyers. And then he didn't fire his lawyers and he continued with Grant Cooper and basically just let because, Cooper railroad him. See, that's because nobody wanted another Oswald thing. You right. know, Oswald didn't get a trial, you know, and what happened with the Warren Commission was a joke. So they were determined to go through with this trial come, you know, Hades or hell water. Okay, and so they, That's right. they they decided they were going to go through with this. It was like a public show trial, really. Right, yeah. right. And so, so Grant Cooper, now, this did not come out to a long time afterwards, okay? Um, and in fact, there's two things that did not come out until a long time afterwards, okay? Uh, that Grant Cooper more or less volunteered for this job and he was 
also under investigation because of his conduct during the so-called Friars Club. The Friars Club scandal. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Now, what was the Friars Club? That was a very exclusive, high-class, celebrity kind of a club in the L.A. area. I think Jack Benny was a member, you know, and these kinds of All the of greats people. were in the Friars Club. Right. Okay. And they used to arrange games of poker, okay, at the Friars Club. Well, guess what? If you can believe it, Johnny Rosselli was a member of the Friars Club. Okay. Mm -hmm. In other words, this gangster who had been associated, you know, with Sam Giancana, you know, and Santo Traficante, et cetera, all right, and was involved with the plots to kill Fidel Castro as he was being recruited by the CIA, who was actually down there at JM Wave. You know, the big CIA base mm -hmm. in Southern Florida. Miami. Okay, with his buddy Bill Harvey and sending teams of Cuban exiles across the Florida Straits into Cuba. This guy is a member of the Friars Club. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, obviously, if somebody like that is allowed to get in there with all these rich celebrities, they are going to try and do some subterfuge to get some money because that's how they make money. Okay, it's by, by cheating. All right, and so this is what happened. Johnny Rosselli rigged the card games at right. the Friars Club. I think I think he did it. And got he, caught. Was it a camera or a peephole he had? I think it was a camera. Okay, right. Yeah, okay. And watching they, the cards. Right, and he mm -hmm. they would relay what was in the other guy's hand. So, well, right. obviously, if you know what the other guy's got, you're not going to lose very many games. Okay? House always <laughs> wins. <laughs> All right. And so... And um, what's remarkable is that they actually got caught and prosecuted right. because usually the authorities in L.A. look the other way at this sort of thing. But yes. for whatever reason, that one was actually prosecuted. Well, probably because Rosselli had something to do with it, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, and so uh, what happened is that Grant Cooper was one of the attorneys in the defense of that case. And he got caught stealing grand jury testimony, okay? Which, if you don't understand, grand juries are supposed to be totally, they're not, grand juries is the indicting kind of part of a trial the what they call the petite jury is mm -hmm. the actual uh they adjudicate guilt or innocence all right and grand jury testimony is not supposed to be seen by anybody okay all right and so grant cooper got caught okay and he was this is what so many people find so compromising right about sirhan's defense is that at the same time he's defending sirhan He's also involved with this Friars Club thing, and he's under investigation. He could get busted. Worst case scenario. Disbarred. disbarred. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Well, here's. don't think that the people running the trial didn't know this because they did know this. Of okay. course. All right. They did know this, and they talked about it. All right. All right. Because when I used to know Larry Teeter, who was one of uh, Sirhan's attorneys. One of Sirhan's lawyers, right? Later, in later years. Yeah. And he actually showed me the documents in which the whole team running the trial against Sirhan was well aware of the whole Rosselli thing. Mm. Okay. You know. Uh, now, let me ask you this question. If you're well aware of this, why did you ever let him take the case to begin with? I mean, why are you, that is the question. Yeah. Why would you do something like that? You know, and I don't <laughs> think there's an innocent answer. Right. Yeah. You know, so at the end, what happened? Because the case quietly went away. That investigation went away after the Sirhan trial. Cooper right? did not get disbarred. Cooper right. did not even get. Disbarred. I don't even think there was a disciplinary action. It was you know just what he all had to forgotten. Do? He had to pay a thousand dollar fine. That's it. That was it. Yeah. That was, a fine. that was it. For a high class attorney like Grant Cooper, that was a, nothing. The best solution 
that you could come up with. Sure. Is paying a thousand dollar fine. Okay. You know, so that's why so many mm. people suspect that there was a, as they say, quid pro quo, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that's how Cooper got into this case. All right. And just to clarify for our listeners who don't know the case as intimately as we do, Grant Cooper was the lead attorney yes, he for was. Sirhan. And now, of course, Sirhan had an entire team of attorneys. And uh, one of the attorneys, he had a couple of attorneys actually on his team who were leading Arab American lawyers uh, who fought for the, you know, the civil rights of Arab Americans. They were there on the defense team, basically to make sure that Sirhan didn't get railroaded um, and that he did get a fair trial. Like, uh, what's his name? Abdin Jabara, uh, very famous civil rights attorney for Arab causes. And he's a personal friend of Sirhan's to this day. I That's some of the papers I went through recently for my report. I wanted to look at papers from that's available now, it's open to the public. Um, he donated his papers to a university archive, and I'd never actually looked at those before. And it showed me what I didn't realize is that there was actually a tremendous effort made, especially by the Arab members of his defense team, um, to try and get him the best defense possible um, and to make sure that he was not, you know, treated unfairly by Grant Cooper. But, you know, admittedly, even his friend, his defense lawyer, said to this day he doesn't believe, and that Sirhan didn't believe that there was any kind of conspiracy. Uh, you know, he says that Sirhan told him many times that there was no conspiracy. He acted alone. He had no known conspirators. Um, well, Lori, where did the girl in the polka dot dress come from then? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, that, the she's an anomaly is, that we can't quite explain. Why, I don't think she was an anomaly. Okay, well, okay. Let's explain. The girl. Well, there are a few, right? There are at oh, least wait, three, wait, wait. Well, three different about, girls in polka well, dot dresses. Yeah, but that only way. one had the pattern of dress that was standing next to Sirhan. Okay, all right. Who's the girl in the polka dot dress? Sandy Serrano, who was a very important witness, who incredibly uh, did not testify at Sirhan's trial was a Kennedy worker, okay, who was standing outside the ambassador on the night of the assassination. And she had stepped outside to get some fresh air. She said that, and by the way, the reason this would not go away is because Sandra Van Oker interviewed her that oh. night yep. on NBC on a national hookup. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everybody saw her say this, okay? She said that a girl in a polka dot dress, white with dark blue or black polka dots, went up the stairs that she was standing at with one tall guy and one shorter guy, okay? And she saw them go up these stairs, all right? Now, this girl, who was very striking looking, okay? She was supposed to be pretty, okay, shapely, curvy, etc. Okay, and and you know that's the kind of dress you wear to get attention <laughs> <laughs> when you wear a brightly colored you're, you're, polka dot you're, you're, dress. You're stealing all my punchlines, Lori. <laughs> it's like <laughs> notice me, notice me, everybody. <laughs> okay, first of all, first of all, that's what was so striking about her—the combination of her look plus hmm. this dress. Okay, you know, and so seventeen witnesses. And believe me, I know this because I went through the LAPD files. 17 witnesses saw her with Sirhan that night. Okay. And if you can believe it, well, do we have enough time to go into that whole thing about SUS and Hernandez? And sure. Pena? Okay. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, before we get to that, let me play a clip, short clip here. Um, I, I wanted to talk about Sirhan a little bit because he's so fascinating and he's kind of the center of the story since this is the anniversary of his trial but uh, as most people know he was he was denied parole 17 times right. over the which years until which is unprecedented yeah. for that charge 
And then in 2021, the California Parole Board actually did recommend him for parole. And ultimately, his parole was denied by Governor Gavin Newsom. But I just want to walk you through how many times this guy's been up through for parole through the years and how his story has changed over the years. Take a look at this. My thanks to all of you and now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. The alleged assassin, Sirhan Sirhan, was wrestled away by police. Sirhan Sirhan was arrested that night and tried for murder. He got the death penalty, but California's death penalty was ruled unconstitutional in 1972. The sentence was changed to life in prison. I don't even know that that the man is dead myself, so if there is any conspiracy, I'm completely unaware of it. In 1975, the parole board ruled that Sirhan should be free in 1984. Larry Trapp is arguing against Sirhan's release. We cannot permit political assassination to become a way of life in this society. We've seen what it's done in other countries. Sirhan Sirhan was again asking to be released from his life sentence for shooting Robert Kennedy in 1968. He was to be freed in September 1984, but that date has been rescinded. Sirhan said he considered the death just another homicide and that the board was not considering his case fairly, but asking him to renounce his political views. If we go on this case as a straight homicide without consideration of the identity of the victim, then I I feel that I eminently qualify to be paroled and all. But the panel once again decided against Sirhan, saying only that he is not suitable for parole. Sirhan's request for parole was rejected for a tenth time. The California Parole Board said Sirhan is still a danger to society. For his part, Sirhan said he now believes he did not kill Kennedy in 1968. L.A. Deputy District Attorney Thomas Trapp calls Sirhan's denial preposterous, mind-boggling, and insulting to the American people. I, I was, I, obviously I was there. But uh, I don't remember the exact moment. I don't remember pulling my gun uh, out of my body or whatever it was located. And I don't remember aiming it at any human being. Now, there are growing calls for a new investigation. Kennedy's son, Robert Kennedy Jr., telling the Washington Post he met the man convicted of the crime, Sirhan Sirhan, in prison and left disturbed that the wrong person might have been convicted in the killing of my father. Sirhan Sirhan was stabbed this afternoon at Donovan Prison in the South Bay. Sirhan Sirhan was taken to a San Diego hospital to be treated for the stabbing injuries inflicted by another inmate. The 75-year-old man has been in custody for more than 50 years since Kennedy's assassination back in 1968. Today, in a stunning decision, the parole board recommended the gunman be released from prison, something few had predicted. There will be a 90-day review before the decision lands on the governor's desk when RFK's killer could become a free man. Something that's interesting I should point out, um, you know, Sirhan's story did change a lot. Uh, At his trial, he said, I did it, 20 years of malice aforethought, not even denying it, I confess. On the night of the shooting, Carl Uker, I believe, was the witness who said that he asked Sirhan why he did it. Sirhan said, I can explain. I did it for my country. I love my country. He was referring to Palestine, and he was heated at Kennedy over his support for Israel and his uh, support to sell 50 Phantom Jets to the Israelis. Um, He did do it on the one-year anniversary of the 1967 Six-Day War between Israel and the Arab nations. So, um, you know, that when they talk about how he, one of the reasons that they denied him parole was that he refused to renounce his political beliefs, right? Which he shouldn't have to do. It's his right to hold those beliefs, and he came by them honestly. I should, you know, remind everybody he was from Jerusalem, He went through the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. His family suffered terribly in that conflict in what they call the Nakba. They were displaced, had to move to Jordan. 
Uh, he lost a brother, his older brother, Munir, when he was young. Um, he saw the bombing of the Damascus Gate. He saw carnage and people disemboweled by bombs. And he was like four years old when he went through all of this, right? So we had all this trauma. So my point is, the California Parole Board in 2021, when they did finally approve Sirhan for parole, they didn't do it because there any new evidence had come forward. It was not an evidentiary decision. It was because of a new law that had been passed by the California State Legislature um, requiring parole boards to look at things like, and these were factors they'd never considered in the past. The new law said they had to consider things like age, health, and childhood trauma. And it was that that swayed their decision. They understood Sirhan's reasons for being so politically radicalized and for doing what he did. So that was the actual reason for, for the uh, recommendation for parole. And then it went up to Governor uh, Governor. Governor, Governor Newsom, <laughs> Gavin Newsom, the governor, <laughs> it goes to his desk and he deliberated for quite some time before making a decision. And uh, when he said no, when he denied the parole, he was asked why. And he said the reason, of course, he claims that Robert Kennedy was his hero. And so the case meant a lot to him personally. But the reason he denied it was he actually made a trip up to Sacramento, where the archives are, the California State Archives, and he made a point to review the evidence himself. He sat down, spent like a week going through it all, we're told. And I don't know, have you ever been to the archives and looked at the Robert Kennedy collection, Jim? No, I've never, I've never been there, but I know people who have. Yeah, I went there, but it was like 25 years ago to do research. I haven't been back to the archive since, but it is fascinating. And most people, you know, the thing about the Robert Kennedy case, as far as I know, outside of the uh, Mary Farrell Foundation, the documents are not available online. Um, the California State Archives, for whatever reason, has not digitized the archives. So if you want to look at the stuff... You literally have to travel to, to Sacramento. So I'm going to take you inside the archives, give you a look at some of the key artifacts and the key documents in the case that you can't see anywhere else unless you drive to California. Look, this is it. Tonight we take a walk back in time. Three bullets fired into Robert F. Kennedy in Los Angeles in 1968. The night that he won the California primary changed the course of history. Now his convicted killer, Sirhan Sirhan, is awaiting a decision from Governor Newsom as to whether he will be paroled after parole commissioners gave their okay. While everyone waits, Bill Schuman was granted extraordinary access to what's called the assassination collection as preserved by the state of California. He joins us live now from downtown L.A. near what used to be the Ambassador Hotel. That's right. Now, the Robert F. Kennedy Community School Complex. You know, Los Angeles has seen so many huge moments in history, Alex and Marla. Some good, some bad. None bigger, though, than what happened here in 1968. And it was just an extraordinary morning that we spent in Sacramento going through the evidence, the life of Sirhan Sirhan. It's an historical treasure filling parts of six floors inside the Secretary of State's office building in Sacramento. It's the State of California Archives. Established way back in 1850, it's now run by Tamara Martin. I think it's my dream job. It's an amazing experience. I feel very fortunate to come here every day. And I think just being able to experience history and, and really providing public access to it. Fox 11 got special access to what has to be the most unusual item stored here. Donated by the LAPD in 1987, it's what's called the Robert F. Kennedy Assassination Investigation Collection. So this is Sir Han's gun, as it's called, it was presented into evidence. Inside a plain cardboard box on padding, the actual eight-shot Ivor Johnson 55A cadet revolver Sir Han Sir Han used to kill Robert F. Kennedy. We could look, but not touch. It looks so tiny. It's very small. Assistant archivist Beth Benham showed us the items. The gun, 
the bullet fragment stored in baggies, one tiny one in a test tube, all taken from Kennedy's body and the five others wounded that night. Yes, these came out of people's bodies. We saw the eight small spent casings discolored by age from Sirhan's gun. And through it all, an armed CHP officer watching. Why? It's required by the rules since there was a firearm in the exhibit. In fact, the entire assassination collection is kept apart from most of the other 350 million items inside what's called the high security vault. While we were allowed broad access to the entire collection, our camera was not allowed here. This video provided by the state. It's standard protocol for the priceless items. What's the reaction when people see that Kennedy collection, typically? I think typically there's a lot of surprise and shock. Shock and surprise over? Over just the materials being here and, and also just due to the graphic nature of some of the items contained within the collection. Kennedy hospital sheet. Like the sheets from RFK's hospital deathbed, folded, sealed in plastic. You can still see the sweat stains on the, on the collar. The actual clothing the convicted killer wore that night also wrapped up. Mug shots. Photo booth snapshots of Sirhan as a young man in the San Gabriel Valley. And booking photos from the night of his arrest, 5'5", 120 pounds, 24 years old. Even examples of Sir Han's own writing found in his house presented at trial. So this is an actual page from his notebook. It's a, it's a photograph of it, yes. Take a look at the line, Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated. We now switch live to the Kennedy headquarters in the Ambassador Hotel where the Senator is expected to make a statement. KTTV covered the Senator that terrible night, June 4th, 1968, a victory speech at LA's Ambassador Hotel after winning the California primary. My thanks to all of you and now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. Thank you very much. Seconds later, Kennedy lay dying on the floor of the hotel's pantry. Sir Han later convicted of firing the three shots that hit him. With that revolver, his brother actually purchased from a neighbor for $25. There is, of course, renewed interest in the case. Now that Sirhan, 77, was granted parole by two commissioners back in August after 15 previous denials. I think it's very important to preserve all of these materials and all of this evidence uh, because history, too, has its claims. Uh, and people will want to look at this over the years. And USC political science professor Bob Shrum, a 25-year-old Harvard law student when Robert Kennedy was killed, later a longtime Democratic political consultant who worked for Kennedy's brother Ted. He, still close to the family, adamantly opposes parole. We spoke as I was preparing to visit the archives. What would it be like for you to be in that room with all that trial evidence and exhibits? Well, it would bring back all the pain and all the memories. Uh, I think Sirhan Sirhan didn't just murder one man. He murdered the best hopes of a generation. There's nothing that can undo it. But that doesn't mean that the person who did it should be let out of jail. Yes, all the pain, the memories. Governor Newsom spoke of something similar when he told me of the messages he's received since the parole board's decision. The stories, the, the emails and text messages I've gotten from people, people aren't just giving an opinion about yes or no. They're, they're expressing their memories of that time. Memories preserved forever here in Sacramento. Meantime, the key question remains, Will Sirhan ever actually get out? That's a fair question. His parole is still under legal night. review. Uh, if so approved, the then a decision for the governor, if I get in the who said Robert Kennedy was a hero of his, so draw your own inference. The process has to unfold. It has to come to me formally. If I get in the middle of a process with just two people recommending the full board and a UDK, I could put that entire process at risk. Well, Alex and Marla, Bob Shrum and, other, Bob Shrum and others who are familiar with Governor Newsom's thinking, his respect for Robert F. Kennedy, uh, would be shocked if he approved Sirhan Sirhan's parole at the age of 77. But it is possible. If he does get out, I'm told that he plans to live with his brother, who still has a home in the Pasadena area. As for the state archives, normally they're open to the public, but not now because of COVID. 
But under normal circumstances, anybody could make a request and have access to some of the incredibly rare and important exhibits. Of course, the uh, Kennedy Assassination Investigation Collection, the most unusual there in Sacramento. Alex, Marla? Uh, in terms of a timeline, Phil, and by the way, that was all extremely fascinating, mm. uh, how soon would that legal review come to an end and the governor's decision happen? They have until the end of December. They don't have to take all that time. And then the governor has a period of time to review it. So it could happen in December or January, uh, if not sooner. And just to underscore Phil's point, I mean, RFK is the political hero for Gavin Newsom. He has one picture of one politician in his office. It is RFK right. and his father, who was a judge at the time. He is his guiding light. So that does tell you something. It would be shocking if he approved that. Uh, but Phil, I'm just wondering on a human level, would be. Um, what was it like being in that room and, mm -hmm. and seeing all that stuff? It must have been quite yeah, something. It was, um, it was chilling. It, it was chilling to, to see that revolver on the table in front of us. And it, it was tiny. It, 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 your hand would, would dwarf it. Um, to see that, the bullet fragments, to mm -hmm. see a bullet fragment that was in Robert F. Kennedy's body, mm -hmm. The, the shell casings, to read Sirhan's writings, Robert F. Kennedy must die, must be assassinated by June 5th. Remember, he now claims he has no memory of the assassination, though he confessed to it at trial. Uh, it, it, it was chilling. It was also, um, it, it was rewarding to see that it was preserved with such care for, for future generations. Interesting, some things uh, have disappeared. RFK's clothing. We were originally told that the DA's office had it, the police department had it. No, it was sent to the archives. It wasn't there. Then we're told it may have been sent to his family at some point. Uh, we weren't allowed to see, for example, the autopsy photos, not that we would be able to show them to you anyway. We weren't allowed to see um, the results of blood tests, um, grand jury questionnaires right. because of personal information. But all in all, we, we did have extraordinary yeah. access, and we appreciate the folks from the, uh, mm -hmm. from the state archives working with us on that. What a report. Yeah. Phil Schumann, thank you. Thank we'll you, be right Phil. back. So, yeah, it was kind of a cool look inside the archives that most Americans have never seen those items. And, and it is stunning that it was just a little 22, right? I mean, I'm, I, I wow. love firearms. Uh, I mean, a little 22, that's a pea shooter. It's, that's why the other five victims thankfully survived uh, without much damage. You would have to get very close to someone as the autopsy confirms that the fatal shot to actually kill them you would have to be within a few inches distance and uh you know it all comes down to i think the question the big question that's never we've never been able to make the ballistics match the autopsy report and that's why I'm still open, Jim, to being persuaded that there was a second gun, even though you would think after all these years, might have been able to prove that by now. We've never actually been able to prove it. Something that's interesting about this is that, um, you know, as we were discussing earlier, the trial of Clay Shaw was going on at the same time as Sirhan's trial for the JFK assassination, right? And by that time, the majority of Americans believed that there was a conspiracy in the case of JFK, right? All the polls showed that. But in the RFK assassination case, at the time of Sirhan's trial, most Americans believed that he acted alone. Um, they accepted his confession at face value. The evidence seemed convincing. And there was no talk at all of a conspiracy until six years later. And the guy who initially raised the question of a conspiracy was our mutual late friend, Paul Schrade. Um, Paul Schrade was a friend of Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy. He had been a labor organizer on JFK's 1960 campaign and also on Robert Kennedy's 1968 campaign, friend of Cesar Chavez, uh, brought Kennedy together with Chavez and the United Farm Workers. And Paul Schrade was standing close to Kennedy in the kitchen, I guess a little too close, and he got hit by one of Sirhan's bullets that night, right in the middle of his forehead. Fortunately, made a full recovery, no brain damage, and lived to a ripe old age, 
Um, Paul died at the age of 97 uh, back in November of 2022. But uh, 50 years ago, in December of 1974, Paul Schrade held a press conference with former U.S. Congressman Allard Lowenstein demanding a reinvestigation of the Robert Kennedy case. And that's how this all got started. That's how the conspiracy ball got rolling. And I'm going to show you that press conference. Here's a, a brief clip of that right here. From Following a hearing centered on conflicting ballistics testimony at the Sirhan Sirhan trial, Los Angeles Supervisor Baxter Ward is calling for an official reopening of the Senator Robert Kennedy assassination case. In the course of the hearing called by Ward, Two firearms experts raised questions about the fusillade of bullets fired on that fateful night some six years ago that could, if substantiated, bear out claims that more than one gun was used in the assassination. The testimony today reinforced the earlier affidavit of Mr. Harper and statements from two other criminologists, both of whom I believe are nationally respected, uh, one coming from Northern California, one from New York, uh, nailed down conclusively that the bullets did not match up in their primary characteristics. Kennedy supporter Paul Schrade, who was seriously wounded that night in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, has been following Ward's attempt to get the case reopened with more than casual interest. The difference between the, the bullets uh, uh, in evidence uh, could mean there was a second gun, possibly a, a second assassin. Uh, we don't know. We don't even know if Sir Han was the assassin, although the obvious evidence uh, led everyone to conclude that. Supervisor Ward, who currently is a Democratic candidate for governor in California, will make a formal presentation of his findings next week. So, in that lawsuit, CBS News actually joined Paul Schrade in that lawsuit along with, uh, well, one of his, oddly enough, one of his uh, counsels on that case was none other than Vincent Bugliosi. <laughs> that's, that, Remember that's that? Correct. That's, yeah. that's correct. And I, and I think we should hammer this home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that Vincent Bugliosi wrote a pretty bad book on the JFK case <laughs> called Reclaiming History. Mm -hmm. This book was so bad that I wrote a book attacking the book. Okay. That's right, you, you did. <laughs> the JFK assassination, the evidence today. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, but in the RFK case, not only did Vince have a different idea, he ended up in court, okay, defending uh, Bill Turner and John Christian in, I think it was a civil action for uh, defamatory uh, writings. Okay. And Bugliosi always yeah, believed, right. always believed that there was a conspiracy in the RFK case because he simply said, there's no way in the world he could have gotten off that many shots with Euchre's hand, you know, with, with, with any accuracy. All right. Okay. So Bugliosi split the difference here. He's for the RFK case. He's against the JFK case. Isn't okay. that interesting? Isn't that really something? That's, yeah, it is. Very few people know that. Okay. I, I had to bring it up because we love to make fun of Vincent Pigliosi. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but he was good on the RFK case. Yeah, right. Um, it, let me give you the rundown of what Paul Schrade's lawsuit was all about because it's interesting. He filed the lawsuit against Sirhan Sirhan and 50 other John Doe's, some of whom were members of the government in California. Paul, uh, you know, I interviewed Paul. We were good friends. I probably got 12 or 13 hours of taped phone interviews with him about the case. And I went back over those and made some notes. Paul told me that he had three goals with that lawsuit. One was to force production of documents through discovery. Two was to compel the LAPD to release all of those evidence files which took like 20 years. We didn't get them until 1988, 20 years after the fact. And three was to ask the court to order a panel of experts to refire Sirhan's gun and re-examine the ballistics evidence. Um, now, the judge did grant Paul's uh, petition partially, granted part three, 
ordered a refiring of Sirhan's gun and an analysis of the only three intact bullets. I guess the others had fragmented so much that they weren't testable. Um, but the panel of seven expert examiners concluded that these three bullets matched each other, but <laughs> no one knew for sure which gun they came from, uh, which provided even more fuel for the conspiracy fire. And Vincent Bugliosi said that while he had no question about Surhan's guilt, that that did not necessarily preclude the involvement of others. And after 35 years now of researching the case and re-researching it and changing my mind a few times, I've pretty much come to that same place where Bugliosi left it. Is It doesn't rule out a conspiracy in my mind, but I'm satisfied with the evidence as it stands and mainly Sirhan's own words, which we'll get to later, that convinced me that um, he probably did it. <laughs> um, you know, the, the DA never called the other suspect, though, as a witness. Not before the grand jury, not at trial. They never gave the other suspect a polygraph test. His gun was never test-fired. Um, and Bugliosi really focused in on the, the other suspect, Thane Eugene Caesar, who was a rent-a-cop, um, who was there that night to do crowd control at the Ambassador Hotel. Um, he was the only other person in that room that we know of who had a weapon, had a firearm, and was seen drawing his gun. He was very close to Kennedy. He was behind Kennedy and seemed like the most likely other suspect. And yet, the cops had well, no there, there interest was in him. Another suspect. Well, would you, would so I'm told, to, yeah. You, Tell you us about the been. other third suspect. Lisa Pease told me a little bit about it before. Michael, but Michael Wayne. Michael Wayne. Michael Wayne is the third suspect. And okay. who was Michael right. Wayne? Okay, now first, let, let, let's set the scene first. As you so accurately said, Thane Eugene Caesar was like rent a security guard and he told two distinct lies, okay, about his presence here that night. That he had been working at a security for a long time, which he hadn't, okay, he had only applied there like a week before. And okay, Ace and Security was a brand new company. It had only been incorporated like a month or two before. So he, you know, he couldn't you know work there a long up, time. You know who ends up owning Ace Security or running Ace Security? Oh, who was it? Dwayne Wolfer. D oh. <laughs> oh, wow. Dwayne, Dwayne Wolfer was the very dubious <laughs> ballistics expert. Yes. Okay, That's who right. has been torn apart by so many people. I didn't even want to begin the list. Mm -hmm. How, what a bad job he did on the ballistics set. So I guess it's just a coincidence that he ends up Isn't running a security. Okay. Huh. Now, Wayne, oh, excuse me, let's stay a little bit with Caesar. Okay. Caesar was in the perfect position to deliver the bullet part, the bullet uh, projectiles. He was. Into Bobby Kent. No, nobody was in a better position than he was. Okay. He, he pulled the gun and... This happened to be almost a matching gun to the kind of gun that Sirhan had. And so... Well, of course, Caesar claimed his gun was a thirty-eight. Uh, they, they found the gun. It, right. It, it, it wasn't a thirty-eight. That was another lie that he told, <laughs> okay. apparently. But he, right. he always He's, maintained he had a thirty-eight, not a twenty-two. He said that he sold the gun before the crime. That's not true. He sold it after. After. And they like, found the guy... Mm -hmm. who he purchased the gun okay right. All right now he also ended up with bullet particles in his eyes that's right okay. how, how he was go? so close <laughs> apparently that he got the tattoo on his face no, not a tattoo but they were particles in his mm -hmm. eyes okay mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. all right he fell to the floor and bobby kennedy was if you can believe it he had his tie in his hand Right, a little was, clip as, on as, tie. Right, as he was slipping to the floor. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, Dan Eugene Caesar was clearly a suspect in this case. 
he was, let's say, given the soft shoe treatment by uh, Hernandez and Pena. Okay, Hernandez is the guy who ran the polygraph tests. All right, Pena is the guy who supervised the investigation. The LAPD formed a special unit senator called SUS to investigate the crime. Both these guys had worked for the CIA. Okay, all right. Now, if you compare, and I'm sure you've heard it, if you compare Hernandez's examination of Sandy Serrano Mm -hmm. to Hernandez's examination of Dan Eugene Caesar, it's night and day. That's right. Okay, all right. All right, now the third it's They didn't even want to talk to Caesar. I mean, according to Caesar's own testimony, when he talked to author Dan Moldea, who wrote this book, this classic back in the day, um, Dan is the only author that Thane Caesar would ever actually speak to. So Dan pretty much had exclusive access to him. And, you know, Caesar tells the story. I was just rereading it today about how for, he was trying that night, he said, at the ambassador to give testimony to the police officers on scene. He's like, look, I'm, I'm the security guard who was standing closest to Kennedy. Would you like a statement? And they're like, nah, not really. <laughs> and he had to ask him like three times before they finally took him down to the Rampart station and got a statement from him. And then he never heard from LAPD again. They just... Mm, forgot about him now you now what's really strange about that is they rounded up everybody that night mm-hmm. there were literally dozens of people that were escorted you know driven down to the rampart state but this guy you you don't want to talk come on please all right no polygraph didn't and, and he offered his gun when he was sitting there at the rampart station he says would you like to take a look at my weapon would you like to inspect my weapon and they're like nah don't really need it nope that's now, fine. The third guy is Michael <laughs> Wayne. Okay. The third yeah. Guy now, is who is Wayne. Michael Wayne? Okay. Now, this is this is interesting. Okay. Mike Michael Wayne used to work at the Pickwick Bookstore. Okay. In L.A. He was there that night. He was there that night. But even beyond that, he was standing outside of the Robert Kennedy Suite. Okay. And he was actually looking in as the door would open, okay? And his excuse was that he was a collector and he wanted to Bobby Kennedy uh, to sign a wall picture, okay, that, that, that he had, okay? Now, Michael Wayne is there very early, okay? And according to the investigation that Lisa Peace did, okay, he was walking around the scene, okay, asking questions about where Bobby would be, et cetera, that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. right? Then he's in the pantry, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. If you had witnessed this shooting, Okay, wouldn't you have reacted like everybody else did, like standing there in horror, maybe screaming, maybe weeping, okay, trying to Mm -hmm. get a doctor? Michael Wayne ran out of the pantry. He ran out of the pantry. And a couple of witnesses that said that they saw him, okay, with what they thought was a piece of metal wrapped up in that picture, okay? And somebody finally tackled him. All right, so he couldn't get away. Now, this is obviously another guy that you would want to question, that you would want to bring in for a polygraph, you know, that you might probably give him the third degree. Okay. You would think. You know? Yeah, you would think. There were but, so many leads, though, that they just didn't follow up on. Mm-hmm. Well, it's you astonishing. Know, you, you, you can take that for. Uh-huh. That's, the, that's the benign argument. Right. Okay. But if you ask me, because I've seen my, uh, what's his name's, uh, Pena's work and Hernandez's work, you know, th- th- I don't think these guys were interested at all in, uh, okay, because we didn't finish the girl in the polka dot dress. Oh, no, okay. we didn't. All right. <laughs> we only took her from before the assassination. 
Okay. Yeah. She was quite clearly bird dogging Sirhan. Okay. And like I said, she was seen by many, many witnesses to be with him that night. Right. The last memory that Sirhan has is her pouring is her- him a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think the last thing he remembers is her saying more sugar or something like that. Okay. All right. Then she leads him over to, to the pantry. And she's standing right next to him, right next to him in the pantry. Then she turns and smiles at him. And then he jumps forward. Now, here's the closing act of Sandy Serrano, why she was such a dangerous witness. She doesn't know what has happened in the hotel. She doesn't know Bobby Kennedy's been shot at. Okay. The girl who went up the stairs, who she remembered so distinctly, now comes down the stairs, except the short guy's not with her. Mm -hmm. Only the tall guy is with her. And she says, words of the effect, we We shot him. him. We We shot shot him. him. Okay. And she asks, who did you shoot? And she says, Senator Kennedy. Okay. Now, here's the other part of the girl in the polka dot dress story. There was a guy named Bill Fahey who was at the ambassador that day. He said that he met this very attractive, dark-looking, perhaps Arab woman, okay, at the hotel, and he asked to go for, she wanted to go to ride because he was going out to Oxnard for some business thing, okay? So they took a ride out to, Oxnard is about 70 miles away from LA, okay? And they went out there, it's a beach city, and they had a cup of coffee, all hmm. right? And he said she was very fearful about what was going to happen that night. Okay, she wouldn't tell him exactly what it was, all right? But said she didn't really want it. She said words of the effect, I didn't really want to go along with it, okay, et cetera, all right? Now, Interesting. Now, it's more than interesting. It's, you know, and so so they did to him what they did to Serrano. Okay. All right. The same thing. They gave him the third degree, did everything they could to negate his story. Told him his memory was faulty. (laughs) And so (laughs) he ends up doing the same thing that Serrano did. Okay. Which is temporarily retracting his story. See, See, they knew. They knew. They had to get rid of this girl with the polka dot dress because it was so incriminating. And the yeah. newspapers had uh, blasted it all over the front page of these papers. And in fact, some of the newspapers actually did reconstructions with pictures of this girl in the polka dot dress. OK, you know, and so they had to do they did everything they could uh, to get rid. They of made the- her disappear. Right. You're exactly yeah. correct. That, I couldn't have said it. You're stealing my lines tonight, Lori. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we, see, we've gotten to that point where we finish each other's sentences. <laughs> That's how okay, many interviews now, we've done. Now, okay. There's, let me, okay. We talked about Michael Wayne. We talked about Fahey. We talked about the girl in the polka dot dress. We talked about Grant Cooper. Okay. We didn't talk about Special Exhibit 10. Okay. Do you know what Special Exhibit 10 was? What is that? All right, Special Exhibit 10. Uh, Lynn Mangan died a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know who she was. Sure, sure. Okay. Longtime advocate for Sirhan. Yeah, she was the chief investigator for Sirhan for a number of years, a long time. All right. And there probably was no better person who was a better archival researcher because she lived in Nevada. Okay, across the border from Sacramento. And she used to go over there all the time. A lot more than Gavin Newsom ever went there. (laughs) All right. Okay, now, Special Exhibit 10. 
was the bullet that you were talking about earlier. Okay. It's called the, it's, I think it's called the Weinstock bullet. Okay. But they used in the Baxter Ward hearings. All right. And they said it matched the other bullets, but they couldn't get it to match the gun. Well, right. Lynn Mangan went further than that. Okay. Patrick Grant was the kind of secretary uh, to those hearings. All right. Um, I might be now. I want to preface this by saying I might be getting a little bit confused because there, there was the Baxter Ward hearings, and that was seventy three, I think, and there was another set. The, oh, the Judge Wenke panel, the Judge yeah. Wenke panel. Excuse me, that was seventy five. That was seventy five. Right now, they admitted that they, what I was talking about earlier, and what you were talking about earlier, that they had trouble matching it uh, to the actual weapon. Patrick Grant was the secretary. He put identifying marks on each of the bullets and he made a record of it, of what he had put at the bottom of the bullet to make to keep them straight and make sure that there was a chain of custody. Right. Well, when Lynn Mangan went over to Sacramento, she found Patrick Grant's notes. Okay. And at that time, so I think she got kicked out later. All right. They didn't want her there anymore. She was causing too much trouble. Okay. And uh, knowing Lynn, I totally <laughs> believe that. <laughs> All right. Uh, she, she was feisty. She was actually able to handle the actual projectiles. Wow. And she looked at Patrick Gant's notes and she looked at the projectile. And guess what? They didn't match. Hmm. Okay. The identifying mark was different. All right. And and when she saw this, she immediately thought of Bill Harper. Because she had studied at the, at the uh, chair of Bill Harper. Everything she got started on, everything she knew at the beginning was from Harper. Okay. All right. And Harper had told her. They switched the bullets and they switched the gun. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And so Lisa Pease took up with this. Um, she actually went up to see Lynn Mangan, stayed at her house, okay, for like a three or four days. And uh, going through her notes, when the LAPD checked in the weapon, because the, the, the weapon was lost that night, Rayford Johnson ended up taking it home. Rayford Johnson was the great Olympic athlete who was one of the bodyguards along with Rosie Greer, you know. Of, uh, yeah, and he would uh, not give up that gun once he took it from Sirhan. He wouldn't give it to the police at the scene. He said he would only give it to them at the police station. So they had right. to take him down to Rampart and, and like pry the gun out of his hands. I mean, Rosie Greer was it, not it, it giving was, away that gun. It, it, was, it was really <laughs> weird. In the notes that Lynn got, and she gave to Lisa, when they were going through all these, they were checking in all the exhibits. When they got to the gun, the guy checking it in said, starter's pistol. Hmm. And it's right, by the way, you're right, it's right there. You can't deny that it's there. And Lisa put it in this article. It says start, and she thought that this was very, very. First of all, I think everybody listening knows what a starter's pistol is. Mm -hmm. It's what you when you start a hundred yard dash race or something yeah. like that, you go ahead and you, this harmless pistol. Okay, you, you fire it into the air, and everybody starts running. That's what a starter's pistol is. You don't use it to kill somebody. Exactly. Because <laughs> it won't work. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And she right. was very, very, very interested in this. Okay. And because it goes back to what Harper said, you know, they switched the bullets, they switched the guns. Okay. And if you've taken a look at Dwayne Wolfer's work on this case, because mm -hmm. he's one guy we haven't talked about yet. Okay. 
Unbe- well, he's the reason we're here talking today because he was so sloppy, and that's that's being generous. Right? Dwayne, if he had done his job right, I don't think we'd be sitting here today talking about it. Dwayne Wolford was the chief ballistics expert. How he ever got this job at the LAPD is, is beyond me, okay? Because me not too. only was he terrible in this case, but he had been terrible in other cases. Private attorneys had tried to get him thrown out, okay? Prior to the RFK case, they had tried to get him thrown out, all right? You know, because his, his work was just so incredibly, you know, third rate, fourth rate, you know, it just, just simply would not fly, okay? And so, But he was, you can believe it, he was the chief ballistics guy in the RFK case, all right? Now, one of the things that was so puzzling is that it's very clear to anybody that there was going to be a problem in what they call, what um, criminalists call trajectory analysis, okay? Trajectory analysis means you try and figure out the origin of a projectile, where it came from, and where it ended up, all right? Well, if you've only got, (laughs) if you've only got eight bullets and you have something like 13 penetrating holes, you're going to have a problem. (laughs) Right. And you have a bigger problem once the evidence is destroyed. Because what, about six months, a year after the trial, those uh, ceiling panels and the the door frames that these extra bullets were photographed, you know, there are bullet holes in the crime scene photographs, but the LAPD destroyed that evidence, um, which has become a major stumbling block for researchers through the years. And their reasoning was, well, you can't fit a door frame in a file cabinet. Uh, (laughs) So they destroyed it. I, I, I would think that if the door frame was from the Ambassador Hotel on the night of June the 5th. I, I, Get a storage I unit. Able, I, yeah. I think you would be able to rent someplace <laughs> exactly. that you keep this stuff at. Right? Um, unbelievable, yeah. the excuses yeah. that they gave. So if you take a look at Wolfer's chart, which many people have, it is one of the freakiest things you're ever going to see, you know, because they talk about in the JFK case, they talk about the single bullet, the theory. magic bullet, yeah, yeah, the magic bullet. Well, in the RFK case, you have about three of these things. Okay, <laughs> yeah, you have about three of these things, you know, and and the thing that Trey did not believe, and it what got him so interested in what really happened that night, is when he saw the trajectory of the bullet that went through the top of his head. Mm -hmm. And he looked at Wolfer's chart and he said, nope. No way. (laughs) That could not have happened. Right. That, 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 That could not have happened. All right. And so this Wolfer's testimony was one of the things that Bugliosi and there was, um, another lawyer who I actually talked to, Okay, Bugliosi and this other guy, whose name I can't remember now, they wanted to get Wolfer on the stand, okay, to answer these questions, okay? You know, and Wolfer, to put it mildly, didn't do very well, okay, (laughs) under under cross-examination. So here you have, here you have, on the one hand, you have an honest pathologist with Noguchi who did some very good work. All right. And then you have this, I don't know what you want to call Wolfer, uh, is this Acme Renner expert, okay, <laughs> you know, doing the ballistics. And you have one guy doing a really good job, and you have another guy doing a terrible job. All right. You know, and, and one guy is on the stand being asked pointed questions, while the other guy gets more or less shoved off. All right. Uh, Noguchi gets, you know, shoved off with some softball questions, you know. And so this is what you had for Sirhan's trial, all right? Now, 
let me add another thing. See, Saran has said different things at different times because he's had different lawyers at different times. Right. Okay. So one lawyer tells him, you have to admit that you did it. Okay. You have to admit you did it. It's the only way you're, they're going to parole you, et cetera. Okay. He gets a different lawyer, Larry Teeter. Mm-hmm. Okay. Who says, you didn't do it. Okay. You right. didn't do it. All right. Okay. And now this time around, okay. The last time around, you know, I don't think he could have said anything, you know, that would have made Gavin Newsom uh, change his mind because Gavin, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, there's this uh, split in the Kennedy family, which I'm sure you're aware of. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the whole right. world has heard about that by yeah. now. Well, I don't know if you know this, but the ones who want to keep Sirhan in prison hired a lawyer from Pat Cipollone's law firm. Were you aware hmm. of that? Didn't know it was Pat Cipollone's law firm. Yeah, right? well, if you don't know who Pat Cipollone was, he was mm-hmm. the White House counsel for Trump. That's okay? right. He's one of these guys, you know, the you want an hour with him, you're going to pay $5,000. Okay, that's the kind of high-priced lawyer he was. All right. And so they hired a lawyer from Cipollone's law firm. All right. And they were he was their chief advisor, and I believe he communicated with uh, with Gavin Newsom. You know, the thing is, I kind of like Gavin Newsom. You know, I think on most things, he's an agreeable kind of a guy. You know, but look, it doesn't matter what you think of the case. What matters is that Saran has been treated so discriminatorily by the justice system, you know, to nobody. Uh, if you read most of the books on this, the average term for something like this is something 16 and a half years. Okay. And then you get paroled. Well, this is now 50 years. Well, they let John Hinckley out finally. Right. That's, that's correct. And he didn't yeah. even kill anybody. <laughs> I mean, All right. technically speaking. So, you know, the, the, the justice system in this case, I believe, has just been, you know, so unfair, you know, and so discriminating that... You know, uh, Sirhan has a different lawyer now. Uh, Is that Lori Dusek? She's still his no, 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 counsel? No, 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 it's somebody else now. Oh. Okay, and because they decided that they needed a lawyer who specializes in parole hearings, okay? And then, and so she has now taken the case, all right? And she was going. she's going to appeal Newsom's ruling. Uh-huh. Okay? All right, in fact, I think she already has, all right? So anyway, interesting. Yeah. So See, this this is what we're stuck with. Okay, you know the assassination of the '60s. You know, and 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 it's it's a very terrible thing, I believe. You know what's happened to these cases. You know, you know there's they're really simply none of them were adjudicated in any kind of fair and honest way. Well, and you know, I've never really heard. Have any of Sirhan's lawyers ever filed a motion for a new trial? I know there have been all these calls no, for a reinvestigation, one. but uh, I'm talking about a new trial or, you no, know. No, Larry did try and do that. It was either did Larry he? or Bill Pepper. Okay, and you know who shot it down? Who? Kamala Harris. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> huh. So I get, the only way you get ahead in the Democratic Party from California is if you hmm. go along with this whole RFK thing. First, Kamala Harris did it. Now <laughs> yeah. Gavin Newsom is doing it. Now huh. Kamala Harris is VP. Gavin Newsom is going to probably run for president. Right. Next. Right. You know. Hmm. Well, you know, so, you were talking about uh, Bill Harper, William Harper, the ballistics expert. Who, you know, he's the guy that kind of got this ball rolling for. Uh, a case of a second gun or a conspiracy, or at the very least, just a really terrible job by the LAPD. Um, but how this whole thing started, just to take you back in time, um, Bill, we're Bill talking Harper. like 50 well, this, years ago. Yeah, this is the, like 60, I think the uh, Bill Harper started on the case very early. I think 69. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a, but he, he didn't was, say anything 
no. derogatory about the process until the 70s, right? That's right. when we started right. hearing that he had issues with it. And immediately, of course, the mainstream media started to attack him and discredit well, him. That's and, putting it mildly. That's right. The Washington true. Post came right. for him. Uh, there was a staff reporter, you probably know, Ronald Kessler, who wrote a piece uh, right after that press conference we showed you by Paul Schrade, um, you know, saying that, uh, you know, Harper had admitted to him that there's no evidence to support this contention that, you know, Sirhan didn't kill Kennedy, tried to say he didn't say it. Bill Harper then wrote a letter to the editor of the Washington Post and said, yeah, I did say that, and I never retracted my statement, and you're lying. <laughs> and then the L.A. Times jumped in, and they attacked Paul Schrade and Allard Lowenstein's efforts to reopen this case. And, you know, throughout the trial and, and later all throughout the 70s, you could always count on the L.A. Times to run cover for the LAPD, the Los Angeles DA's office, the California Attorney General. All of them blamed William Harper for all this renewed interest in reopening the case. They just wanted to let sleeping dogs lie. And what kind of brought this to national attention was in 1975, Allard Lowenstein, former congressman, went on firing line with William F. Buckley Jr., right, on PBS. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, Lowenstein was a liberal. Buckley was a, you know, arch conservative who disdained conspiracy theories in the JFK assassination. You know, there were many classic shows of firing line uh, where they were debating conspiracy theorists on the show. But he was actually very fair in that interview with Allard Lowenstein. I recommend anybody who's interested in this case, you can go find that episode of Firing Line on YouTube. It's the April 20th, 1975 uh, episode, and it's really, really worth watching. Uh, Lowenstein and Buckley, this is interesting. They were actually close friends in real life, which I think is why Buckley gave him a fair hearing on the RFK case on that episode of Firing Line. Um, and uh, as you well know, Allard Lowenstein was later killed by an assassin's bullet himself. He was shot in 1980 by a guy that he'd known for 20 years, former right. protege of his and former friend. And William F. Buckley Jr. gave the uh, eulogy at his funeral. And some of you are probably old enough to remember Allard Lowenstein. He was a very impressive man. It was Allard Lowenstein that Paul Schrade told me this. He did not want to get involved in any kind of conspiracy stuff. Um, he believed that Sirhan did it. He always accepted his confession at face value. It was actually Allard Lowenstein who talked Paul Schrade into getting involved in this, right? Much against Paul's will, I might add. He really did not want to be involved in this. So if you don't believe me how impressive Allard Lowenstein was when he argued this case, he literally convinced not only Paul Schrade, he convinced a nation when he went on TV. You know, back then we only had three channels and PBS. We had four TV stations to watch. There was no internet. That was your media. And the alternative media in 1975 was PBS. It's where you would get right. stories that the mainstream media would not cover. Firing Line, no matter what you thought of Bill Buckley, it was a great show. I mean, it was a really, really great show. So he gives Lowenstein an hour to make his case to the American people. And that show changed so many minds. I don't have a clip from that Firing Line episode, but I'm going to show you a brief clip of Allard Lowenstein here doing a press, a press conference uh, about their calls to reopen the case and the failings of the LAPD, just so you can get a taste for how powerful and impressive an, uh, a lawyer this guy was. The police report referred to the reevaluation of evidence that supported the official position that Sirhan was a lone assassin. But the police now say that some of the evidence, ceiling panels that had bullet holes in them, was destroyed in 1969, two years before it could have been reevaluated. 
Mr. Lowenstein said the time had come to remove any suspicion about the original investigation and that the decision rested with the Los Angeles Police Department. The questions that we've asked for two years have not been answered honestly or thoroughly. And the reason for that, I can't imagine. But I can certainly say that if we don't get cooperation at this point, with all the material now clear, that the people who are not cooperating have motives that I would like to see examined. Because at this point, no one can question any longer that these issues must be dealt with seriously. Now, but we are by no means saying that all people in authority are resisting this. There are some who are cooperating. But the choice of cooperation or resistance is one that will have to be made now by the Los Angeles Police Commission because it has jurisdiction over some of the critical material we've been trying to get to. The Los Angeles Board of Supervisors has voted to make the police report public. This is Andy McMillan. See, they I, they I, voted I, to make it public 20 years later. <laughs> Allard Lowenstein graduated from Yale Law School. Yes. Okay. This is not someone that you could just dismiss as a oh, wild-eyed, yeah. crazy conspiracy theorist. He's a former congressman. Yes, Yale Law. Uh, very impressive record. And that's why yes. we had to take him seriously. His famous motto, which he bandied about a lot with the LAPD, is, look, in my experience as an attorney, people who have nothing to cover up don't cover up things. Okay, so you know there that's you not it. what I'm getting in this case. Okay, so. <laughs> right, right. So, and you know, you after see. that, uh, after that controversial episode of firing line aired and set the country on fire, and people started talking about this, uh, Ben Bradley editor of the Washington Post, who had published the article by Kessler uh, discrediting Bill Harper. You know, Ben was a good friend of the Kennedys, especially close to President Kennedy and Jackie. He fired back. He was mad as hell. And he fired back at, you know, Buckley, Schrade, and Allard Lowenstein for just stirring up questions of conspiracy in the RFK assassination. He was, you know, and I don't know if you remember this issue of Rolling Stone. I have it. I still have it. I had it when I was a kid because I was so interested in the JFK and RFK cases that I still have this in my archives. It was the April 24th, 1975 issue of Rolling Stone. And they did this big, it, like the whole episode, the whole issue was about the JFK and RFK assassinations. So they talked to Ben Bradley and he said, quote, Ron Kessler did a recent story knocking down the second gun theory in the RFK case. And nuts from both coasts were all over me. Letters, telegrams, phone calls, personal visits. I've been up to my ass and lunatics. <laughs> Which I think is a great quote. Now, you, you said he was on firing line. <laughs> Allard Lord. He yeah. also did around this time if you can believe this, a cover story on the Saturday Review on the RFK. Now, if you weren't around back then, the Saturday Review was a pretty big-time magazine. Mm -hmm. See, back in those days, all the magazines were on the newsstands, you know, and you would see the Saturday Review right next to, like, Newsweek, okay, on, on the mm -hmm. newsstand. He gets a cover story on this big-time magazine at the same time he gets on PBS, it's just, you know, try and think of that happening today. No way. Okay. Right. But back then, somebody like Allard, as eloquent and as educated as Allard Lowenstein, could do something like that. Now, Bradley, I don't know if you're aware of this. Bradley sent Kessler out to, now, let's, let's, not, let's not do this with kids' gloves. Ron Kessler has always been, well, when he was with the Washington Post, he was always Bradley's trusted guy who could go out and do a nice smear job on somebody that Ben didn't like. That's and right. And Bradley, Bradley was, to put it mildly, he was, I know a guy who did, in 1975 or 76, when there was a movement to go ahead and try and reopen the JFK case, if you can believe it, Bradley actually did a debate up in Boston 
with one of the co-founders of the assassination information. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And I talked to this guy. I talked to this guy and I said, well, what was that debate like? And he says, Jim, to call that a debate is a complete <laughs> misnomer. Bradley came out of the gate with foam dripping from his mouth, you know, his <laughs> eyes on fire. And it was not a debate at all about what had happened in Dealey Plaza. He was attacking me. He was attacking all the people who believed it was a good, all the writers, yeah. Mark Lane, okay, Harold Weisberg. It was nothing but like 45 minutes of Bradley fuming about all the crazy mm. people who were destroying the country. See that? Yes. See that? See the whole idea of Ben Bradley being best friends with JFK and the Kennedys and all that stuff. And the whole thing about him, the reputation he made during Watergate, I've always believed that that was, to put it mildly, a little bit overrated, that he mm -hmm. really wasn't this crusader for truth. That right. uh, Let's put it this way. When you're working for somebody like Graham, like Catherine Graham, how far can you go? Exactly. You know? You know, she was part of the... Well, and, you know, people. Ben was connected to the intelligence community. He was a right. ONI guy. Yes, yes. Yeah. All right. And so, you know, Bradley really got away with a lot of stuff and insinuated that he was, you know, a, a really honest guy, which I, I don't think he deserved that reputation at all. I agree. All right. I agree. Right, now, and, now, and what was the intelligence community's... Uh, and still is to this day. What is how? What is how they fight back and always have been? Is they attack the people who are out there raising questions and calling them conspiracy theorists? As we know, that whole thing was invented by the CIA uh, because people were asking questions about the JFK case in the '60s. Right. The whole um, thing about about labeling conspiracy theorists as being in it for the money you know, or a claim, et cetera. That's in a CIA memo from 1967. That's you right. will not, if, in my opinion, there were very, very few newspapers and magazines who were closer to the agency than the Washington Post was. Okay, we, we now know through the late Bob Perry that uh, the Washington Post was in cahoots with the CIA to smear Gary Webb. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very close relationship there, you know, and, and, and so, you know, that, that might not be there now because there's been a change in ownership, but back then there really was this close association between the CIA and the post. And I'm sure you're aware of this. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Operation Mockingbird. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so it was really a kind of illicit kind of relationship. You know, and I, I believe that's why Bradley liked Woodward so much because yeah. Woodward was he's an ONI man too, right? Yeah, yeah. Also, that's Office they, of Naval that's Intelligence. Why they hit it off so well, yeah. Right, and that's how yeah. Bob Woodward rose through the ranks at the Washington yes. Post, and now holds uh, well Bradley's old job. Um, mm -hmm. He's still holding down the fort against disinformation there at the Post, or rather, spreading disinformation. Um, Paul Schrade, you and I told this story on the episode last November, and since we don't have unlimited time, I won't tell it again. But, uh, you know, Paul Schrade was the guy who came to me 15 years ago, and he was trying to convince members of the Kennedy family, uh, Ethel and the kids, to take a look at things like the autopsy report, the Przinsky recording, and all of this contradictory evidence in the case of RFK's murder, and nobody wanted to look at it. And he knew that I knew Bobby Kennedy Jr. And for a while there, I was this courier. I was sending information to Bobby that Paul would give to me. And he was really trying to get Bobby to take a look at it. At the time, Bobby was not interested. But a few years later, he did finally look at it with Paul. They became good friends, as you know. And eventually, because Paul Schrade, like Allard Lowenstein, was a very convincing and intelligent and persuasive 
man. And he convinced Bobby Kennedy Jr. uh, that Sirhan Sirhan could not have killed his father. And so now Kennedy Jr. is the only member of the Kennedy family who believed Sirhan, who visited him in prison, wrote letters to the parole board advocating for his release. And RFK Jr. is called for the case to be reopened and reinvestigated. Um, And it's now been, as we've taken you through this story tonight, folks, we've taken you through 50 years of history, 55 from the date of the assassination and the trial, through Paul Schrade's quest, which started 50 years ago in 1974, to get a reinvestigation of this case. He spent 40 years of his life trying to get this case reopened and reinvestigated by a disinterested, impartial, qualified third party. Um, And he died waiting at the age of 97. And I want to show you guys, this is just kind of my little uh, tribute to Paul, I guess, a little love letter to Paul. Uh, This is a few years before he passed away. One of the last uh, interviews he gave on the topic. Let's take a look. So I thank, I thank all of you who made this possible this evening. The Ambassador Hotel, Los Angeles, June 5th, 1968. Over a, a thousand people there. Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy wins the California primary. It was just a beautiful moment. After his speech, Kennedy walks with the crowd into the hotel kitchen. And the television lights went on, kind of blinding. Uh, and. All of a sudden, I, I, I felt uh, sh- uh, shaking, uh, like I was being electrocuted. It, it Paul Schrade is 91. Back then, he was a union official, a friend of RFK's. Schrade was shot in the head. That's him on the ground. Five others shot and hurt. Robert Kennedy shot three times. People jumped on Sirhan Sirhan. Grabbed his gun hand, pushed him up against a steam table, flattened him out. Kennedy died. Sirhan was convicted, sentenced to life in prison. Schrade knows Sirhan shot him, but... He couldn't shoot Robert Kennedy and didn't. He was never in a position to do this. Schrade says he spent the last 40 years investigating his friend's assassination. Uh, There's strong evidence of a second gunman. He says experts re-examined evidence. They could not match the Kennedy neck bullet. He got hit in the back and the neck. It was the only whole bullet they could work with. It did not match uh, the Sirhan gun. Kennedy was shot in the back. Schrade says Sirhan was in front of Kennedy. He never shot Robert Kennedy. Schrade alleges a government cover-up. Massive destruction of, of evidence right after the trial. But why? I don't know. You have to ask them because they never told us. We tried to find out. Mm, I miss Paul. You, you Got a good hear, Paul Schrade story? Yeah, I do. We, I we, bet we, you we, do. We, we can close this show with this story. Okay. <laughs> Paul Paul was in a diner one morning, okay, having a cup of coffee and breakfast, okay, and Daryl Gates, who was the chief of police oh, in yeah. L.A. at that time, walks in the diner, and he says, he looks at Paul, and he says, still looking for se- second gunman, Paul? And Paul <laughs> says... <laughs> Are you still incinerating evidence? <laughs> Good one. I wish I, I would have given a lot of money to have been there for that exchange. That's great. Okay. That's so great. Paul had a delightful sense of humor. <laughs> That's what I miss. I miss a lot about him. And you know, it, there is something, another great story that I, I had to bring up because, of course, your expert level on the House Select Committee on Assassinations uh, review of the JFK and the MLK cases in 1979. And, you know, I wanted to ask you this. Paul's dream was to have this case reopened and get a real investigation done. That's what RFK Jr. wants. I assume if he makes it to the White House, he will make that, he'll use his bully pulpit to push for that. Um, 
and he can't pardon Sirhan because the president doesn't have any pardon power over state crimes. It was it was not a federal crime to assassinate a presidential candidate. So it was it was prosecuted by the state of California. Only the governor of California has the power to pardon Sirhan. But there is a lot that Bobby Kennedy can do, and the bully pulpit of the presidency is very powerful in uh, changing hearts and minds. So let me ask you this. Is it too late now to do a real investigation 55 years later? You know, in my mind, it should have been done 45 years ago with the HSCA because they were looking into the JFK case and the MLK case. And originally, they had planned to include the RFK case in that, but there were budgetary concerns I guess, that caused the House Select Committee on Assassinations to drop its plans for the RFK case. And at the time, their reasoning was that the RFK case was pretty much open and shut, right? 77 witnesses saw an assassin in the kitchen shooting a gun. He confessed, found guilty, you know, so they just didn't give it much priority. Well, you know, to be perfectly frank, I'm kind of glad they didn't include it considering how that committee ended up. Well, okay. yeah. Yeah, because right. it, it was it was not a very satisfactory... Blakey would have said yeah. the mob did it, case closed. Right, right. <laughs> okay. And, and Mark, yeah. Shaw, Mark Shaw, who's looking into that case now, will probably come to that that, that, that same conclusion. You know, how, how you get mind control with the mob mm. is kind of a, elusive to me. All right. Exactly. Okay, can, I, can, can I do my commercial for my book? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Here you go. The JFK assassination chokehold. Uh, me and four other authors, okay, Mark Adam Chick, Andrew Eiler, Matt Crumpton, and Paul Blow. And what we tried to do here was to show with the newest evidence how not only did, oh crap, you know, not only did uh, Oswald not do it, but he Such couldn't have done it. Yeah. All right, but but he couldn't have done it. All right, and we try to do this with the most current evidence that, that we could find, okay? And it's an anthology of some of the most current evidence on the JFK case. We've been talking about the RFK case all night, but let me let me close with this. The most moving interview that we did for JFK Revisited, uh, the, the film directed by Oliver Stone and written by me, was with Bobby Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Okay. We, he had come in and he did about an hour-long interview. And when it was about over, I tapped Oliver on the shoulder and I said, why don't you ask him? if he thinks the assassination of his uncle is related to the assassination of his father. Okay. And so Oliver asked him that question. What did he say? We we didn't include it in the film. No, you didn't. Because he, he teared up at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And we we didn't want to put that in, in the movie, but that was the most powerful minute of all but the what did he say, Jim? What did he say? <laughs> You're not going to tell okay. me? Uh, okay, all right. He said, <laughs> he said words of the effect that his father's assassination had never really been investigated. And there's a lot of holes, he believes, in that case. And he says there are identifiable people that you can assume were involved in both those cases and neither one of them has ever really been solved okay to any kind of popular satisfaction you know and and he believes that there's a lot there a lot there to investigate even at this late date okay right and he you know he was kind of doing his own investigation once he got interested in the case and paul got his curious mind working Uh, He started looking into it and spending a lot of time on it, and he actually contacted Dan Moldea, 
who had access to Thane Eugene Caesar. Oh, he wanted to interview Caesar. And he tried to interview Caesar. You know, Caesar was living down in the Philippines. Um, and this was like, I think, 2019, 2020, just before COVID happened. And uh, he, he wanted it, of course, money, Caesar right? wanted money. Yeah, wanted Caesar wanted money, like, right? I think he wanted 10 grand. And right. Bobby said yes, which shocked the hell out of me that he was willing to pay the guy that he thought killed his dad for information. But he was willing to cough up the 10 grand. And so he got back to Dan Muldea. I guess Dan was kind of the go between here because uh, nobody talks to Thane Caesar without going through Dan Muldea. Uh, and then the, a counter offer came back. And, 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 and suddenly Caesar is demanding $20,000. <laughs> And so that's where Bobby said, nope, nope, nope. So he missed that opportunity. And then shortly after that, they knew Gene Caesar passed away. Well, that's what they say. I mean, some people say he didn't. <laughs> that he like faked his death to just make it go away. And yeah. that wouldn't shock me because he told Dan Muldea in their very first interview in 1987, you know, even back then people were saying that Thane was dead. And Dan Maldia says to him, you know, they say you're dead. And he's like, fine, good. I like it that way. <laughs> I like it that way. And, right. and he also made it very clear for years and years and years when he kept a low profile, didn't want to be found, that if anybody accused him outright of killing Senator Kennedy, that he would sue them. And he had a team of lawyers ready to go. So that's why Robert F. Kennedy Jr., didn't say a word publicly. I mean, he's a lawyer. He knows better. He waited until the day Thane's Eugene Caesar died, and then he put out a post on his Instagram with a picture of Caesar going, this is the guy who killed my father. Because he, he didn't want to get sued right, <laughs> in right. case he was right. wrong, just in case, yeah. you know. Nobody could be 100% sure of that. Um, you know, Dan Maldia finally gave Caesar a polygraph test, um, and he became convinced that Caesar was actually an innocent man uh, who had been wrongly accused. Have and you seen the polygraph test? No. I have. You have? And I, I attacked it, and Dan Maldia got very angry with me. Oh. Okay, cool. because one of the questions in the polygraph test was... Were you in any position to kill Robert Kennedy that night? And he said no. And he passed the test. And I said, wait a minute. Is Dan Moldea drunk or something <laughs> when, he, when he was giving this test? What do, you, what do you mean that he was not in the position to do what? Well, he certainly was. Yeah, he, well, I said, there was, I said yeah. there's nobody else in the room who was in a better position uh, exactly. to, 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 uh, to uh, administer the coup d'etat. Okay. Yeah. You know? And yeah. so uh, Moldea got really mad at me, okay, huh. and then he, he <laughs> called up Phil Melanson, okay, yeah. who was one of the best writers on the RFK case, yeah. and he goes, who's this D-Eugenio guy? You know, <laughs> Can you have him get off my back, okay? You know, <laughs> you know. I'm actually trying to get him on the show while I'm doing this ongoing series, you know, with the 55th anniversary of... Sirhan's trial, and it's just newsworthy right now because Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running for president himself, mm -hmm. following in his father's footsteps. And unfortunately, like his father, he still does not have Secret Service protection. And he's right. out on the campaign trail in a very dangerous no, but moment. The, dif the difference is Bobby didn't want Secret Service protection. That's right. Okay, That's right. Whereas Bobby Jr. does. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. And that is an interesting point you bring up because, yeah. uh, you know, one of the tragedies of what happened at the ambassador was that, you know, Kennedy's campaign, you know, was like a hippie campaign. And you know how hippies were about cops back in the 60s. They were like, oh, man, you know, we don't want the fuzz around. It'll it'll kill the vibe, man. So Bobby Kennedy told I mean, the Los Angeles police offered protection for him personally while while he was in Los Angeles campaigning that weekend uh, he refused apparently Re didn't want them around him they didn't he didn't want to be photographed surrounded by police 
or bodyguards. Um, and Thane Eugene Caesar also testified that he was told to stay back from Kennedy and just do crowd control. He was not there to be a bodyguard. A lot of people get it wrong and they say that Caesar was hired to be a bodyguard. He was not. He was just there to do crowd control. Right. Um, but RFK Jr., I did want to say that his sixth request now, we're up to six times that he's asked the Secret Service for protection and has been turned down now uh, six times. Nobody can figure out why, because he meets every benchmark to qualify for that protection. It seems that the White House is playing politics. And uh, speaking of playing politics, before we go, I have to bring this up. Uh, today, you're in Los Angeles. Uh, Bobby was in your city today. He did a big event for Cesar Chavez Day at Union Station there in L.A., and Unfortunately, the Caesar family, the Chavez family didn't show up. And in fact, they're pretty PO'd at him right now. <laughs> they're they're oh, quite mad. That. Did you did you hear about this? No, I didn't. This just unfolded like over the past couple of days. Um, you know, the DNC and the Biden White House are doing everything they can now to come after Kennedy because they realize after he picked Nicole Shanahan as his vice presidential running mate, that he's going to come after votes on the left and he's going to take some votes from Biden. So the DNC is very worried and they did that photo op. I'm sure you probably saw the photograph taken on St. Patty's Day at the White House with several of Bobby's siblings and uh, cousins and nephews and grandnephews and a whole bunch of Kennedys uh, with Biden out in front of the White House as a way of just kind of at, at Bobby Kennedy. And so right before Kennedy's Cesar Chavez Day celebration, and RFK Jr. knew the Chavez family and Dolores Huerta, and also, you know, Paul Schrade ran with that whole crowd. Yes. Um, and so he was planning, I think, to have the Chavez family come to the Cesar Chavez Day event today in L.A. But yesterday, they not only endorsed Joe Biden, all of the surviving Chavez family members and Dolores Huerta. Uh, but they also sent a legal threat to the Kennedy campaign saying, do not use Cesar's image or our family name to promote your campaign. Ouch. Um, but, you know, I should also point out that Cesar's granddaughter, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, is currently Joe Biden's campaign man campaign manager. <laughs> so, so there you go. I think a lot of them are working for the Biden campaign or yeah. the Democratic Party. And I have to show you this because I know you didn't make it out to Union Station. I I got a little video here that I my only friend, found out about it the day before. Did you? Yeah, I I should have yeah. told you sooner because it's yeah. not far from you there, um, yeah. and. Yeah, I thought that'd be fun for you to go and, and see that. But uh, Kyle Kemper, who's actually the half-brother of Justin Trudeau, is on our campaign. And he's traveling around the country with Kennedy. He was at the event today, and he got us a little video. I just want to play this for you. It's just a few seconds, and I want to, I want to see what you think of this, Jim. What do you make of, of this? What do you notice about the signs and the people holding them? Take a close look. Can you read them? No, not really. Oh, these are Trump people? No. They're MAGA, uh, protesters. Yeah, they're protesters and they're saying that RFK is MAGA. He's a Trump plant. He's here to wow. spoil the election. Shame on RFK. And a lot of these signs, they're all in Spanish, right? Espanol. Do any of those dudes look Spanish to you? Well, they wouldn't have masks on. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I mean, not a single one of them is Hispanic. Oh. I bet you none of them speak Spanish. All the signs here look to be done by the same person. Right. Same you know, writing. there's a. Yeah, the same writing on every sign. 
And to me, it looks like a bunch of, you know, newly arrived migrants who uh, picked up a day job working for the DNC or now, the this, Biden this, campaign. This is today? <laughs> yeah, that was today at Union Station there wow. in your city of Los Angeles. Wow. So it, to me, they look like paid protesters. And I just wanted to see what you thought when you look at I, that. I, I really don't know what to make of that. That's really weird. Uh-huh. You know? Isn't that wild? That shame on RFK? Shame on RFK. MAGA RFK. Wow. What? What in the world, right? Well, if so, you ever wanted to see what a threat Bobby was to the system, you know, because he's getting it from both ends now. You know. Yeah, that's right. And the other day, uh, he did his vice presidential announcement there in Oakland, and right. there was a handful of you know pro Biden, anti RFK protesters, and they were there with a truck. You know, they had like a, I forget what the banner said on the side of it, you know, something like RFK sucks. Um, but it said literally at the bottom, paid for by the Democratic National Committee. Oh, really? Oh, that's, that's rich. <laughs> I kid you not. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> so I guess on a closing note, as we sort of bring this Sirhan conversation to an end, I'm going to play a clip that I doubt most people have ever seen um it's an interview during the trial with sirhan's father who had the same name sirhan bishara sirhan and his father was an interesting character you know he abandoned the family they came over to the united states from jordan and then apparently he was uh an abusive husband to his wife sirhan's mother mary was abusive to the kids, abandoned the family, and went back to Jordan. Um, and during the trial, a reporter tracked him down. He spoke perfect English. And uh, it, this is the only video I've ever seen of Sirhan's father. And what he says here is kind of chilling. It's like he predicts the future. It's... Um, after Sirhan had been convicted by the jury and they were trying to determine whether he would get the death penalty, right? And he's trying to say, well, he warns that if Sirhan goes to the chamber, um, basically there's going to be hell to pay for the United States and Israel. Mr. Sirhan, yes. do you think there will be an appeal? Well, I think there is going to be an appeal and there is going to be more than this. More than this. And I have, uh, I uh, want to say this to the court and I want to mention the American people too. They shouldn't keep quiet for the action which took against Sirhan in the court. Because this action is going to bring more trouble to the Americans, to the leaders of the United States, and uh, this which I don't want. They should think a little further. They should think about the reason which Bush Sirhan to kill Senator Kennedy. And I want to advise the leaders of the United States and the whole leaders in the world to take a real action, to take a real steps for peace. Otherwise, there will be more trouble and more trouble and more trouble. And this is against my will. And if they keep sticking uh, to put their hand in the gas chamber or to give him a life in prison, uh, I am sure this will have a reaction uh, all over the world. Boy, and he wasn't just whistling exactly what he was talking about after Sirhan was, in fact, given the death penalty. Um, and, of course, that was later reversed because California got rid of the death penalty for a while. And Sirhan was given a, a reprieve and uh, sentence was commuted to life in prison. But 
you know, after the assassination of RFK, whether you believe that Sirhan was guilty or innocent, um, in the Middle East, like in Egypt and in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Palestine, he was a hero. Uh, Fatah had posters that they, thousands of them distributed everywhere in the Middle East that, you know, had that famous quote from Sirhan, I did it for my country. He was a hero. And yeah, there was trouble. Everything that his father said came true. Two years later in 1970, uh, you know, there was that swath of uh, terrorist hijackings, the popular front for the liberation of Palestine, which was a communist Palestinian liberation group, hijacked four airliners, passenger jets. Uh, They tried to hijack a fifth, but that was the only one that they did not succeed because it was an Israeli airliner. (laughs) And the Israelis know how to deal with terrorists. So the Israeli flight, they were not able to successfully hijack. But they did successfully hijack four other planes, took hundreds of hostages, and demanded the release of Sirhan Sirhan from prison. Um, At that time, President Nixon would not negotiate and um, so they, did, they didn't kill the hostages, though. They let them go, and then they blew up the airplanes on the tarmac in Amman, Jordan, which was a spectacular fireball. I don't know if you remember that whole incident. And not only that, this is an interesting sidebar to the whole story. Two of those planes, actually three of those planes, were headed for JFK Airport in New York. And they had originally planned to blow them up over New York City. And the date that they blew them up was September 11th, 1970. Weird! And then the story gets even weirder. Two years after that, RFK's eldest son, Joseph Kennedy, who was later a congressman from Massachusetts, he was like 19 years old, and he he and Teddy, Senator Ted Kennedy, had gone over to Greece to do some, you know, stuff. And he gets on a plane and the hijackers knew that he was going to be on this Lufthansa flight. So they hijacked the plane because they knew Senator Kennedy's son was on board and again demanded the release of Sirhan Sirhan as part of their demands. Again, thankfully, the hostages were released unharmed. But then a year after that, uh, they got tougher. I think it was the same group, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They burst into the embassy in Saudi Arabia, the U.S. embassy at Khartoum, took 10 hostages. Three of them were American diplomats. And once again, President Reagan would not negotiate, and they demanded the release of Sirhan Sirhan. Um Nixon said, nope, and they killed all of the hostages and tortured them before before killing them. So, you know, to this day, Sirhan is still seen as the guy who was the first to advance, bring the Palestinian cause to the attention of the American people through the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Lori, have you you ever studied Sirhan? Oh, yeah, deeply. Yeah, yeah. When I was studying this case okay which i'm not doing anymore uh if you talk to his friends because he went to pcc mm-hmm. pasadena city pasadena college city. And tracked along it, you know uh sirhan really wasn't all that political okay uh he wasn't you know, until you asked him about israel and then he'd give you an earful <laughs> okay uh you know and he was more or less uh kind of a typical young man okay who was trying to more or less find himself you know in in this new fangled world because if you remember you know there were a lot of things going on vietnam etc mm-hmm. you know at that time you know i think and that's why he was mad at senator kennedy because he th- well, you know okay, he, senator said, kennedy was against the vietnam war but he thought he was a hypocrite for supporting israel well, while claiming know, to you, be an anti-war you, candidate. Do you, do you understand the problem with those Phantom Jets? 
you understand the problem with the Phantom Jets? Explain. The, that was the video of Bobby Kennedy saying that. Right. Okay, was not broadcast until after Sirhan put it in his notebook. Okay, and so if you if you studied Sirhan as a subject for hypnosis, you see that he was very susceptible to what's called automatic writing. Mm -hmm. Automatic writing is done in almost a trance state. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, and it's very repetitive. Yeah. Okay. The and notebooks had a certain repetitive cadence to them, right. like as right. if they could have been done under hypnotic suggestion. Well, yeah, I don't think there's any question because you, you essentially had Brian admitting that he did <laughs> program Sir Hans. He did say that. He did. Yeah. CIA right. brainwasher. Okay. William Jennings. So, and, and Kate, we haven't talked about Brian, but Brian yeah. was this very famous psychologist and hypnotist. Okay, who was strongly suspected of being a government uh, employee. And in fact, he was. He trained mm -hmm. whole cores of people, you know, in, in that. And then he had a big studio downtown in L.A. who Christian and Turner suspected that he was the programmer. Okay, because, and I don't know if you've ever said this before, if you're aware of it. On the night of the assassination, now remember, I'm saying on the night of the assassination, he got on the Ray Bream show. Ray Bream was one of the most popular talk shows in L.A. at that time. The guy was a legend for a long time. Kind That's of right. a conservative kind of a guy. Mm -hmm. not, not a Rush Limbaugh type, but he was kind of a conservative guy. Brian got on his show that night, that night, and he said, you know, from what I'm hearing, Ray, this has all the earmarks of a Manchurian candidate case. Mm. Okay. Mm. Now, let me ask you a question. Who on earth that night even suspected <laughs> that Sirhan was a Manchurian candidate. Who even knew what the Manchurian candidate was? Exactly. At that time. <laughs> Strange thing to say so on that night. Of, yeah, this is one of the mm. things that Turner and Christian interested them about Brian. Okay. And so they sent <coughs> a secretary down there undercover to interview Brian. Okay. And she said she was doing an article. Okay, uh, about hypnosis. And <clears throat> Brian consented to the interview. One of the questions that she asked him was, do you know there's this controversy about whether or not you can hypnotize somebody into doing something that they would never do in a normal state? And she said, when she said that, he exploded, okay? He stood up in his chair and started shouting, I know that there's some people who believe, but it's impossible. You can't do it, okay? Please, and if I knew this interview was about that, I would have never, and he started throwing the chair around. He walked out wow. of his own office and slammed the door <laughs> behind him, okay? So, you know, as they say in some cases, that's consciousness of guilt. <laughs> right, right. And he was a wild man. Yes. I mean, that guy had a reputation yeah. of being a, you know, yeah. just a Hunter Thompson kind of crazy right. guy, you know. Uh, so, and apparently anyway. he made that confession that he had uh, programmed Sirhan while he was right. with a couple of ladies of the evening getting very right. drunk. Right. I think it was. Yes. All right. So maybe he just said that to impress the ladies, but it's always made me wonder if uh, it's actually Lori, true. Lori, you don't have to impress a lady tonight, okay? You know? Maybe that's not the best way to make a first impression, right? You, you, you I probed him someone to kill Bobby Kennedy. Oh, that's great. 
<laughs> what do you want to do next? What yeah, you- <laughs> right? <laughs> Hard to imagine that uh, being a good come on line with a girl, but gee whiz. <laughs> So, so anyway, so I think I think we gave your audience a pretty good overview. So that's, oh, you uh, sure did. Uh, uh, and it, uh, you know, as usual, we've gone over time by about thirty minutes. But right, you know, right. it's always such a great conversation with you, Jim. And Thank you're you, a, Lori. A, a, an absolute walking encyclopedia of information. Thank and you so much. Uh, thank you for giving us the time tonight, for sharing your wisdom. And uh, where can people follow you online uh, at kennedysandking.com? Well, you, 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 you mentioned the kennedysandking.com. Mm-hmm. That's, that's my website. And you get articles there. You get reviews. Uh, you get a, every once in a while, you'll get an interview, et cetera. And uh, we're, we're still going after years and years and years we're, 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 st- we're still going on Kennedy's and King. How many years has that website been up? I've been reading it. For oh my God. 20 oh my years God. at least. I, I would say close to 20. Yeah. yeah. I, w- I, yeah. I would say close to 20. And it's one I'm of my regular, favorites. I'm a regular on black op radio like yeah. every other week. And let me give my book another plug. The JFK assassination show called. Enjoyed and that. It was great read. You, I read you, it over thank Christmas. You. Thank you so much. Lori. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. We'll see you back here very soon, I'm sure. We will We will continue this conversation because it just gets better and better every time we talk. And everybody out there, thank you for watching. I hope you learned some things you didn't know. I bet you learned a lot listening to Jim Diagenio tonight. And we will continue this Robert Kennedy series. Maybe next time I'm going to bring on an expert who believes that Sirhan was guilty and let them make their case. Tonight, you heard the case for the defense, uh, for Sirhan's innocence. And next time, we'll bring in the other side and hear what they have to say and let you, as always, the viewer, be the judge. You're the jury, actually. And I'm just the moderator. (laughs) So I bring in the experts and let you make up your mind. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you back here next Saturday night with our guest, Caleb Maupin coming back to the show to tell us all about his recent trip to Russia. He was there for the Russian elections, got to briefly interview Vladimir Putin himself. And uh, also, I think he left the very day of the Moscow terror attack. So thankfully, he was out of the country when that happened. But he has a lot of interesting stuff to tell us. Caleb's always fun. He'll be here next Saturday night at 9 p.m. So until then, everybody, good night and peace. In a universe full of ideas, we draw likeness from the dark to a place where opposites attract. Right meets left. Positive touch is negative, sparking an explosion of truth. Because politics makes strange bedfellows. This has been a Maverick Multimedia Productions.